Hello and welcome to Unworthy History. I'm your host, Daryl Worthy. Here on this show, we try to talk about actual history that's unworthy of TV channels like the History Channel. Unfortunately, the History Channel just, just, just doesn't show much history anymore. Uh, and so today I'm going to continue uh, reading from this book right here, uh, Henderson K. Yoakum's The History of Texas from 1685 to 1846. This is volume one of his two-volume history uh, that he published back in 1855. Uh, and so here uh, we're going to read uh, back from around 1811 and 1812 uh, and on into 1813 possibly as well. Uh, this is uh, the story of uh, the Mexican Revolution and sort of its uh, first stirring. So today we're going to read uh, about uh, Maggie, uh, who was one of, uh, another one of the first revolutionaries to sort of lead in uh, a revolutionary army. So we're going to first hear uh, how he tried to recruit soldiers, or he came about recruiting them, uh, from the no-man's land between Texas and Louisiana that had resulted uh, in 1806 from General Wilkinson. Wilkinson's negotiation uh, with the Spanish general uh, near the border between Louisiana and Texas, or present-day Louisiana and Texas. So this was a stretch of land. I've actually done a previous episode uh, on this uh, that basically no one governed it. So it wasn't U.S. land. It wasn't Spanish land. It was like a no-man's land between. And we're going to hear about that state uh, of affairs in that uh, area about five years or so. Uh, after um, it was first, the, the treaty was first signed by Wilkinson and the Spanish commander. The territory lying between the Arroyo Honda and the River Sabine, which had been left as neutral ground by the agreement between Wilkinson and Herrera, had become the rallying point and refuge of a large number of desperate men. Many had removed there with their families and established permanent residences. They made war upon all enemies and, like the buccaneers, lived upon the fruits of their trespasses. They were more particularly partial to the Mexican traders who brought horses and specie from the interior to exchange for merchandise at Natchitoches. These they preferred as victims because they could rob them with, the great, with greater impunity. They had a regular organization, their headquarters, outposts, and whatever else of contrivance they deemed necessary to carry out their objects. The Spanish authorities had done what they could to suppress them. Twice had the military forces of the United States entered the territory and drove them off, burning their houses and fixtures. They were not to be thus driven away. On one occasion, a number of Mexican traders loaded with silver had reached Salt, Salitre Prairie on the west bank of the Sabine. On their way to Natchitoches, a small Spanish force was stationed at this point for the protection of trade, as well as to prevent adventurers from passing over to Mexico. They sent to Major Wollstonecraft, then commanding at Natchitoches for an escort to guard the traders across the neutral ground. The request was granted, and a small guard was dispatched under the command of Lieutenant Augustus W. Magee. The traders were brought safely as far as Lanon, a small creek west of the Adeas. At this point, the creek made a bend in the form of a horseshoe, the convex side being towards Natchitoches. The freebooters of the neutral ground, 13 in number, had stationed themselves opposite the bend on both sides of the road, having the creek between them and the road. When the traders had all passed into the bend, and just as Lieutenant Maggie and his guard, who were in front, were crossing the creek, the robbers advanced and fired. Maggie, seeing himself overpowered, fled with his guard to Natchitoches, and the poor traders were relieved of all their valuables and sent back to Salitre Prairie. For the time, the money, was ta money taken was concealed by the leaders of the gang under the bank of the creek, and they repaired to their several homes to await what would follow. The amount taken was so large that it could not pass unnoticed. The next day, Maggie, having been reinforced, returned to make search for the robbers. He met two of them going into Natchitoches, and recognizing them, took them into custody. As legal proceedings at this period were not much regarded, they were tied to trees and whipped, with a view to make them disclose their associates. Failing in this, a live coal fire was passed along their naked backs, but still no disclosure could be obtained. They were then taken to Natchitoches and delivered into the hands of the civil authority for trial. 
During the time of these occurrences, Colonel Bernardo Guatieres arrived at Natchitoches. He formed an acquaintance with Mackey, and they had together many long conferences. Mackey was young, bold, and romantic in his disposition, and drank with eagerness the marvelous tales of Bernardo. As Republican revolutionists in Mexico had in view a federative system like that of the United States, Maggie had convinced the idea of conquering Texas to the Rio Grande and building up a Republican state with a view of ultimately adding it to the American or the Mexican Union as circumstances could admit. He informed himself fully of the geography and resources of Texas, of the distracted condition of Mexico and Spain, and made his arrangements with consummate skill and secrecy. It would be necessary to have the aid of the Mexican population of Texas, and this would require the use of the name of Bernardo as commander-in-chief. It would also be necessary to have the aid of the freebooters of the neutral ground. This Maggie engaged himself to secure. It would likewise be requisite to have as auxiliaries the Texas Indians. These could be obtained through John McFarland and Samuel Davenport, both Indian agents and decided Republicans. And finally, it would be necessary to have supplies. Colonel Davenport had the wealth and disposition to serve as quartermaster and contractor to the army. The arrangements all being completed, pre-proposals were published in the name of Don Bernardo Guatierez for raising the Republican Army of the North. The publication promised to each volunteer $40 per month and a league of land to be assigned to him within the boundaries of the new republic. Maggie saw the leaders of the freebooters and notified them to repair in June 1812 to the rendezvous at the Sabine on the east side of the Sabine River. He himself visited New Orleans <clears throat> where he obtained a few supplies and engaged some young men of respectable character to join him. Having arranged these matters, he returned to Natchitoches. To carry out the plan agreed on, Bernardo re repaired to the rendezvous on the 14th of June. His force there amounted to 158 men. They were of the neutral ground that could not be conquered. They were ready and able to do anything that the same number of men could do. It was understood that Maggie should remain yet longer at Natchitoches and forward supplies and recruits. And in the meantime, the force of the Saline was to cross the Sabine at Gaines Ferry, drive the enemy before them, and halt at the Spanish Bluff on the Trinity for further orders. Bernardo and his men set out about the middle of June, crossed, by, crossed the river, attacked the Spaniards at Salitre Prairie, and after a running fight of about an hour, drove them away. In this fight, the Americans lost two killed and three wounded. The loss of the enemy was not ascertained. The Spaniards retreated and fortified the hill overlooking the town of Nacogdoches on the east. The Americans being in close pursuit, the breastwork was hastily constructed and composed in part of bales of wool intended for the Louisiana market. When the Americans came in sight of the breastwork, they charged upon it, and the enemy fled. The former did not even get a fire at them, and when they took possession of the works, the Spaniards were flying through town, and without any considerable halt, continued their retreat to the Spanish bluff. The Americans sent off the wool taken on the hill to Natchitoches to purchase supplies, and continued the march. Their numbers were continually increased by reinforcements forwarded by Maggie. The contractor, Colonel Davenport, was also indefatigable in procuring and dispatching supplies. <clears throat> the fort at the bluff, occupied by about 400 Spaniards, was evacuated on the approach of the Americans. The latter took possession and found also there a large supply of provisions and ammunition. Here they waited for reinforcements. Maggie, on the 22nd of June, 1812, resigned his command mission, preparatory to leaving the United States, and after making his arrangements and collecting his friends and the recruits just arrived, he set out for the headquarters of the invading army. He left behind him Captain James Gaines at the crossing of the Sabine to forward recruits and maintain the communication with the advanced forces. The Americans re remained in the bluff till about the middle of October. So that was uh, the story of uh, Augustus McGee uh, and Watiris. This was the Maggie uh, Watiris expedition uh, that occurred around uh, 1812 or so. Uh, and so this was a really interesting uh, part of Texas and Mexican history uh, that I hadn't heard about uh, much until reading this book. So if you want to see more episodes like this, then be sure to like and subscribe. And we'll see you next time on Unworthy History.